everyone, thanks for coming. I will get started now. And uh, like I said, there's like a lot to cover. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through it initially. Um, any questions you have during, I will leave time for questions. Uh, if you can put them in the chat, um, I'll do them afterwards. Uh, so yeah. So this presentation is on disinformation, uh, conspiracies, conspiracy theory, social media, mainstream media, and you or all of us. Uh, hello. Uh, who am I? I'm Matt Geyer, but you can call me Matt. Um, what do I do? Well, I'm the tech lead and I'm the treasurer for Agrera Lafayette Indivisible. I am a programmer for my day job. I am extremely online. Uh, why did I do this? Uh, so I'm trying to take what I've learned over the past a long time now, uh, years, and try to pass it on. And to help better understand social media and the media environment and everything in which we, we live. But why should you listen to me? Um, it's because I've, I, I, I like live this. I, I'm in social media all the time. I'm online all the time. I deal with technology and computers uh, pretty much all the time. So I have, and I've read deeply on the subject. So I'm trying to put some of this information forward. And how did this all start? Uh, it started as a straightforward explanation of social media and information travels um, and how it travels. It has turned into a broader connection to the right-wing media. And then it went into the how mainstream media operates. And then it was too much information to pack in one presentation and trying to figure out how that's going to work. I don't know, know if I did. We'll find out at the end. And then I cried in the shower. And now I made this presentation and I'm going to try not to cry. And I'm trying to bring that kind of energy to this presentation. All right, what's disinformation? Uh, misinformation, we'll start with that, is a false and inaccurate misleading information that's communicated regardless of the intention of, to deceive. So what's disinformation, the difference between the two, some people consider disinformation a subset of misinformation. Uh, disinformation is deliberate. Uh, misinformation is just false information. Dis disinformation is trying to deliberately deceive you or, or give you false information. Uh, and you can trust that because it's straight from Wikipedia. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let's talk about bias um what's bias and it's uh, an inclination or prejudice towards a specific person place thing or idea uh we have them no like we all have them like you me everybody it, it is important that we acknowledge that we all have biases and on top of that we are not rational uh, some of you, especially more, this more science inclined, you probably think, oh, I'm a, I'm a pretty rational person. Um, I'm here to tell you that you're not, we're not, I'm not. Um, and like, let's talk about some potentially harmful or, or harmless uh, biases. So a uh, harmless bias is like, I, I really like coffee. So if I'm like looking at something and I see something that says coffee, I'm probably going to look at that. I'm more biased towards like looking at something that has coffee. It's caught my eye. I, I like it. I know I like it. Something that is potentially harmful is like if you're pro-military, pro-US military, there are implications for being that. Uh, that's a bias that uh, sometimes goes unacknowledged or, or it's implicit. And, and we, it's just important that we highlight these biases that we have. Okay, sure. But I'm rational. Like I said, we all, some people think, some people think we're rational. We're not. Um, but I'm a person of science and great aptitude and scholarly pursuits. Uh, first off, congrats. That's great. Um, and this is not, not in contest with, with our emotions. This is, you, you can be a person of science. Uh, I consider myself somewhat that I have an engineering degree. Um, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm a completely rational person. That's why we have the scientific method. It's to try to eliminate a lot of those human, uh, biases and stuff like that. And science as a field, not as like the scientific method, it has biases too. Uh, there's this something called the positivity bias. Uh, that's where you, they only publish, or a lot of journals only publish things with positive results. That's a bias. That's only showing things that work. Science is supposed to take all information, including negative, and that doesn't happen. Uh, this is a, a known effect. I have art, uh, links there that talk all about it. Uh, technology bias. Uh, that we can solve everything with technology. That's a, that's a bias of science. These are all things that, uh, that are, are real and, and affect everyday decisions. And again, we're not rational. I just want to really hammer that home. Okay, conspiracy theory. 
There's three categories of conspiracy. I, this is, I, I pulled it from an article. I thought that was really good. Uh, it talks about event conspiracy theories, Kennedy assassination, 9-11, COVID, systematic. Uh, those get into some sort of like racial stuff, you know, anti-Semitic, um, and then super conspiracy, things that encompass many of these individual conspiracies. And then you have stuff like QAnon and Deep State, New World Order, that sort of thing. So when you're thinking about conspiracy, these rough idea of, of how this uh, all fits. Now, an important distinction I want to make is the difference between a real conspiracy and a conspiracy theory. And uh, a conspiracy uh, is like a secret plan. These things happen. These are real. Um, some examples, uh, NSA spying on U.S. citizens, that was real. That was a conspiracy that was hid from, hid from us. Watergate, a conspiracy. MK Ultra, conspiracy. These aren't false. These aren't theories. These are proven. There's, there's records of this. But a lot of times people try to confuse the two. And they do that to try to cover this stuff up, especially like uncomfortable things. Like a lot of those things are either political parties or the U.S. government. People don't want to talk about that. So they'll just try to say, oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. Um, it's important to separate the two out. So why are conspiracy theories so seductive? Uh, we're humans and we, um, we like to identify patterns and connect dots. We, we do that all the time. Um, look at these pictures right here. Um, these are normal everyday objects, but uh, they look a lot like faces, right? Like those all look like faces it's hard to not see the faces. Our brain is hardwired to make these patterns. Uh, it's, it's, it's instinctual. So we, we like to connect those things. And you end up kind of looking like this after a while. I, when making this, I sort of felt like that too. Um, <laughs> we're, we, the strings, we're trying to connect dots. We're trying to find uh, some sort of uh, connection in the chaos. Another thing, it uh, reduces, conspiracy theories reduce a very, very complex world, especially one we have now, it's, it's extremely complicated uh, down to like simple, good, bad. Like it, is, it, it creates it into like, it funnels it into this really easy to understand thing. A uh, little personal story about my politics. Um, so when I was younger, I was, uh, I considered myself like a libertarian, like in the conservative sense. And uh, it, was, it was really easy for me because it was just like drawing a box around really complicated ideas and saying these like two, three rules governed everything. And that's just not true. The world is a lot more nuanced and complicated than that. Um, it also reinforces already held beliefs. So this also preys on uh, prejudicial thoughts and racial animus. It, it, it makes it simple and it can say your problems are that. Doesn't always, it's not always this way, but oftentimes it contains a lot of these um, these ideas. So a lot of people have heard of QAnon. Instead of me trying to regurgitate what that is, I have a video that, that explains it quite well. QAnon is a fascist biblical esoterics apocalypse cult that believes an anonymous government agent known only as Q is leaking sensitive, above top secret information to patriots, revealing that the political and cultural opponents of Donald J. Trump, the so called deep state and Hollywood elite, are the minions of the cabal, literal Satan worshipping pedophiles who kidnap, traffic, molest, and terrorize children in order to produce and harvest adrenochrome, a byproduct of the body body processing adrenaline, which they use to get high during their ritual worship of their lord, who is, again, Satan, a constructed enemy so cartoonishly evil that it justifies discarding basically all human rights in order to turn opposition to Trump into a crime in a sweeping authoritarian purge of undesirables and political opponents called the Storm that will usher in a golden age of peace and prosperity or the Great Awakening. So that's a pretty concise <laughs> uh, view of QAnon, it's it, like I said, it is it is multifaceted, um, to say the least. Uh, I want to talk about like how a lot of things haven't come true, but like a lot of cults or conspiracy things, um, it can't be failed. You can only fail it because of all the times this dingus horde has been hilariously wrong about their Q-themed predictions. Instead of detailing every single one, we'll just put a list on the screen of all the dates that QAnon said there was going to be mass arrests, or some kind of exposure of Trump's enemies in the deep state, or just 
anything happening at all, only to have nothing happen at all. Yeah, so that, that was in 2019, I believe that video was, and that was only some of the dates. So this all led to January 6th. A lot of, a lot of cute people were there. I think people saw pictures of that. Um, this kind of led, kind of like after Charlottesville, it kind of splintered the alt-right. Same thing with QAnon. It kind of splintered QAnon. Uh, it's not gone away. It's morphed into a lot of different things. It's, it's all over the place, and it's, it's hard to follow because it's all over the place. That's what makes it so resilient is its uh, decentralization in terms of, like, ideology. There's not, like, a, a figurehead. It's this imaginary figurehead. It could be anybody or anything. And more importantly, it is now part of the GOP platform. There's someone who is in Congress right now who is a Q believer. And a lot of these ideas and the conspiracy theories have now been brought in to the GOP. A lot like the Tea Party. If you remember the Tea Party, a lot of those same people who were on the Tea Party like brigade are now part of the GOP. And that just became subsumed inside the party platform. So how do we prevent the spread of conspiracy theories? Everybody wants to know this. And I'm here to tell you, there's not a good way. The best way is to inoculate people against conspiracy theory. You being here, me talking about it, uh, me reading about it and telling you about it, it, it helps uh, protect you from being like led by a lot of these things, protects me as well. Um, and the best thing you can do is talk to your friends and family before it even hits them. Like you, they hear it from you and they, if they go into the wild and they hear their friend or somebody else talking about it, they already know like, Oh, my son or daughter or aunt, uncle talk to me about it. This isn't, this isn't something I should get mixed up in. And this is my own little thing. Uh, conspiracy theories because they, they have some kernel of like some, something to help people because they're struggling. Uh, if we help alleviate people's material problems, if we would provide material aid and social conditions, I think a lot of these things would be lifted. I put that in there. All right, look at this easy to understand graph. All right, so how does right-wing disinformation propagate? Um, this kind of looks like it's all connected because that's the thing. It, it is all connected. And it's, it's really hard to draw like a through line completely between all these things because they, they feed off each other. So you have things like message boards like 8kun that used to be called 8chan before it got kicked offline, 4chan, a lot of these forums that are like in the darker recesses of the internet. You have Reddit, YouTube, especially uh, Facebook and Facebook groups. Those are crazy with disinformation, but a lot of those get those ideas from these other places and then they spread on Facebook and, and uh, like the Twitter likes like Parler and Gab, even though those are, they're online, offline. Sometimes that has to do with like, more technical, like kicking off of DNS, DNS servers and stuff like that. Um, that's where it kind of propagates. And then how do you like take that information and like launder it to more mainstream outlets? Uh, like Fox. Fox will have people who have seen a lot of this stuff and they talk on Fox. And then GOP politicians and supporters get on there and they hear it. And so that feeds into that. And the problem with that is then that goes mainstream into more mainstream outlets that a lot of people look at. So New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, all those, they'll comment on what Fox is talking about and they'll say, oh, this is wrong, this is crazy, but they're talking about it. That means that something that was talked about on a message board on HN now is in front of millions of people on the TV screen, uh, things that they probably wouldn't have been exposed to prior. It's a problem. I don't have a, a good answer for this specific one, but this is kind of, you can see how the information moves through uh, these different areas. This is a very fresh example as of today. Um, so you have the great replacement theory. Um, it is a very old, very racist, uh, anti-Semitic trope about replacing, you know, the white race. Uh, Tucker Carlson talks about it, right? Then 4chan talks, there's, you know, that's 4chan and, and an outright Nick Fuentes guy who now is talking about Tucker talking about this. And then somebody comments on Tucker talking about it. And then Dave Weigel talks about that. Dave Weigel works for the Washington Post. Now, somebody in the mainstream, if he gets interviewed on a show or he talks, I mean, he goes on podcasts and stuff. Now he is going to be commenting on it. So now you have this extremely racist thing being into the mainstream. It, it, it doesn't mean that they're supporting it, but now that is in front of people. All right. That's conspiracy stuff. I want to go broader. I want to go talk about the mainstream media. 
Let's do some in institutional analysis. So far, I'm okay on time, so let's, let's keep going. If I give an analysis of, say, the economic system, and I point out that General Motors tries to maximize profit and market share, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's an institutional analysis. It has nothing to do with conspiracies. And that's precisely the sense in which we're talking about the media. The phrase conspiracy theory is one of those that's constantly brought up. To, and I think its effect simply is to discourage institutional analysis. So that's Noam Chomsky. I'm going to be pulling a lot from Manufacturing Consent, the, the film, the documentary. Um, he talks about mainstream media. He kind of echoes what I was talking about before, about how conflating conspiracy theory and conspiracy, all that does is seek to push away any sort of uh, deep criticism. Um, but Dolan Torp, uh, I want to introduce some nuance. All right. I'm, not, I'm criticizing the mainstream media, not in the same effect that Donald Trump is criticizing the mainstream media. I want them to be better. He wants them to stop bothering him and go away so he can do more crimes. That is very different. I think criticism is healthy and I think we should, it's not that I think we shouldn't have an independent media. I absolutely do. I think they should be more independent. Just want to give a caveat on that. We all still have our biases and are all susceptible to propaganda, even journalists. I want to keep hammering that home just because I think it's easy to think that we're above that and we're not, we're all susceptible to this stuff. Uh, if you've ever bought something off of seeing an advertisement, you fell for propaganda. Uh, it just so happened it was sort of innocuous um, to buy French fries or something. I don't know. Maybe you bought French fries. All right, I want to talk about kind of how the mass media or mainstream media shapes narratives. And they do this in all sorts of ways, by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by emphasis and framing of issues, by filtering of information, by bounding of debate within certain limits. Okay, so this is kind of like the, the main thing about how the media like controls what we talk about and what we, what we discuss um, without even really realizing that they're doing this. And I hope to provide a lot of examples that fit these categories as we go forward. So let's first talk about incentives, about media companies. So the vast majority of media organizations, social media, they're companies. And because they're companies, uh, they are seeking to maximize profit. The, that's what they do. That's the system we have. That's what they're known for. Um, media and social media companies, they make their money by selling advertisements. That's their product. Uh, they don't sell the journalism. They sell advertisements next to the journalism. And they want to maximize the number of advertisers to get the most money. I mean, that's kind of like the model. It hasn't changed in a long time. Uh, Facebook didn't change it. Twitter didn't change it. It's still the same thing. And they don't want to print, run, promote things that would drive away advertisers because then they wouldn't be in business. And uh, that's actually, if you've ever seen uh, Sleeping Giants, they've attacked Fox News and a lot of other places by attacking their advertisers. They made their advertisers aware, hey, do you want your ads running against this racist stuff? Uh, a lot of times they didn't. Um, it worked to an extent. It worked a lot. Uh, sometimes these networks are ideological. They don't care about that. They have other programming that can subsidize those people. That's kind of happen is what's happening with Tucker Carlson. I think right now he has like very, very few advertisers, but he's still on and he's still watched like crazy. All right. Speed versus accuracy. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard uh, the lie travels around the globe while the truth, truth is putting on its shoes or some variation of that. Um, so you have, you want, right now we have clicks and we have views and that is extremely important for metrics so they can go to advertisers and say, look at how many clicks or views we have. Um, that is by the first to report or publish. Um, and then everybody references that article, video, tweet, that sort of thing. So you really want to be the first one out there so you can get those, those metrics. Uh, more advertisers, more dollars, more eyes, all of that. Uh, details might not be fully formed, but you really want to be out there first. And that's a problem that those are two contrasting things. Do we want accuracy or do we want speed? And right now the model favors speed, not accuracy. I want to talk about how the medium is the message. All right. People have said this before, but I kind of want to hammer home what this means. I'll have a longer example here shortly. 
Um, how we communicate shapes the way we present and how we communicate that message. The fact that I'm doing this over Zoom and I'm presenting to you, that has modified how I would do this message. It's not the same as me having a, just a normal conversation. Twitter emphasizes speed and spread of communication. Facebook is built for easy sharing and reacting. So you're looking for reactions and you can easily share it one button. And cable news says 24 hours to fill. So they want you there the whole 24 hours. So they're trying to make every issue the most important issue ever. This is a little example. Just analyze things. Why is Noam Chomsky never on Nightline? I couldn't begin to tell you. He's one of the leading intellectuals in the entire world. I have no idea. I mean, I can make some guesses. Uh, he may be one of the leading intellectuals who uh, can't talk on television. You know, that's a standard that's very important to us. If you've got a 22-minute show and a guy takes five minutes to warm up, now, I don't know whether Chomsky does or not. Uh, he's out. One of the reasons why Nightline has the usual suspects is one of the things you have to do when you book a show is know that the person can make the point within the framework of television. And if people don't like that, they should understand it is about as sensible to book somebody who will take eight minutes to give an answer as it is to book somebody who doesn't speak English. But in the normal given flow, that's another culture bound thing. We've got to have English speaking people. We also need concision. So Greenfield, or whatever his name is, hit the nail on the head. The U.S. media are alone in that, that it is, you must meet the condition of concision. You got to say things between two commercials or in 600 words. And that's a very important fact because the beauty of concision, you know, saying a couple of sentences between two commercials, the beauty of that is that you can only repeat conventional thoughts. Suppose I get up on Nightline, say, and I'm given whatever it is, two minutes, and I say, Gaddafi is a terrorist, Khomeini is a murderer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Russians, you know, invaded Afghanistan, all this sort of stuff. I don't need any evidence. Everybody just nods. On the other hand, suppose you say something that just isn't regurgitating conventional pieties. Suppose you say something that's the least bit unexpected or controversial. Suppose you say, I mean, the biggest international terror operations that are known are the ones that are run out of Washington. Or suppose you say, what happened in the 1980s is the US government was driven underground. Suppose I say the United States is invading South Vietnam, as it was. The best political leaders are the ones who are lazy and corrupt. If uh, the Nuremberg laws were applied, uh, then every post-war American president would have been hanged. The Bible is one of probably the most genocidal book in our total canon. Education is a system of imposed ignorance. There's no more morality in world affairs fundamentally than there was in the time of Genghis Khan. They're just different, you know, they're just different factors to be concerned with. Now, Chomsky, thank you. Well, you know, people will reason quite reasonably expect to know what you mean. Why did you say that? I never heard that before. Uh, if you said that, you better have a reason, you know, you better have some evidence. In fact, you better have a lot of evidence because that's a pretty startling comment. Uh, you can't give evidence if you're stuck with concision. You know? That's the genius of, these, of this structural constraint. And in my view, if people like, say, Nightline and McNeil Lehrer and so on were smarter, if they were better propagandists, they would let dissidents on. Let them on more, in fact. The reason is that they would sound like they're from Neptune. Then comes our special conversation on the Middle East crisis. Tonight's is with the activist, writer, and professor Noam Chomsky. Again, there is, has been an offer on the table, which we rejected, an Iraqi offer last April, okay. to, uh, to uh, uh, eliminate their chemical and other unconventional arsenals if Israel were to simultaneously do the same. Have to we end it there. It, but I think that should be pursued as well. Sorry to interrupt you. I have to end it there. That's the end of our time. Professor Chomsky, thank you very much for joining us. The reason I wanted to let that play in its entirety, even though it was probably the longest clip I have, is just because it shows like that does frame exactly how you're going to talk. You're, the way that you are going to speak and the, the message that you're going to bring, even this, like I have to be quick and, and, and to try to make this in the, the time limit. Um, so that does change even what you bring up. So I want to talk about framing. So what is framing? Uh, that, this is one of my bugbears because it is so important how issues are framed and how the media frames them and how we frame them and how the Democrats, the Republicans, it, you know, anybody, how those issues are framed. This is a pretty funny cartoon, I think. Uh, massage is much better than stranger pawing at your bare skin. They, they're not wrong. Neither of them are wrong, but one is definitely more appealing than the other. So this 
is a New York Times headline. And I'm going to be picking on the New York Times because they have notoriously bad headlines. Um, Trump urges unity versus racism was their headline. Now, when this happened, this was in 2019, this blew up because that is a terrible headline, especially in relation to what he was talking about. Uh, Trump gave a speech and he was talking about shootings that happened in El Paso. And during his speech, he never acknowledged that the El Paso shooter was inspired by his words or his actions. But this is what New York Times chose to run with on their printed page and tweets and all that other stuff. Um, that's a framing of an issue that they chose. I want to talk about the Overton window. I wanted to put this in here just to talk about what this is and like what the bounding of a debate is. Um, I don't really have any more to it, but this is a pretty good explanation of a media theory about how people talk uh, about certain subjects. It's called the Overton window. It's a concept in political science that says there's this window of ideas the public is willing to accept. Everything inside the window is normal and expected. Everything outside the window is radical, ridiculous, or unthinkable. And the theory goes that if you want to move the window, if you want to change what people think of as acceptable, you shouldn't start here. You should start here at the extreme because forcing people to consider an unthinkable idea, even if they reject it, makes all less radical ideas seem more acceptable by comparison. It shifts the window in that direction. So if you want to make people more accepting of gay relationships, you should start by arguing for gay marriage. You'll lose at first, but you'll start to make things like domestic partnerships seem more plausible. Then civil unions start to seem normal too. Pretty soon, what started off as an unthinkable idea seems very thinkable, even boring. The point of the Overton window is that people don't have to accept a ridiculous idea, they just have to get used to it. It. have to hear it enough to start comparing other ideas to it. This is important, especially how people go on talk shows. People go on Sunday shows and talk about certain ideas, even if they think they're well outside the mainstream thought. Um, it, this is this is proven pretty reliable if you look at how uh, people react to ideas. Um, that's unfortunately as far as I can go currently on that. So let's talk about sources, guests, and who to platform. So let's talk about the Iraq war. This is the biggest thing to me, especially because when I was a kid, this is one of the things that I actually fought with people um, about in class in like, eight, you know, whatever, eighth grade, early high school. So when you talk about manufacturing consent, um, a lot of times Chomsky talks about uh, East Timor and uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia. This is more of a modern day, I think, manufacturing, especially because this only happened like right after 9-11. Uh, this can go way deeper, but if you remember, people were saying we had WMDs in Iraq. That was why we had to go over there. One of the reasons we had to go there. Uh, so Judith Miller is known for presenting this information, uh, pretty much just how uh, they had these aluminum tubes was the big thing. And Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, Donald Rumsfeld, all pointed to that story and said, see, look, the reporting is real. It didn't matter that they were the ones feeding that information to Judith Miller. And what did she have to say about just parroting um, what had happened? Uh, she said, my job isn't to assess the government's information and be an independent intelligence analyst myself. My job is to tell the readers in the New York Times what the government thought about Iraq's arsenal. This is, this is in New York Times. This is what people pointed to. This is one of the reasons that they gave an explanation to go into Iraq. And how, how's that going even now? Like, uh, and that was, a, I remember telling people, like arguing with people. And that was one of the things I said, but they are trying to get a bomb. So, yeah. So this is big, especially right now. This could go and be a talk in and of itself. Passive voice in the media, police, and how they interact. So if you look, go to that Mother Jones story, it talks all about this, but, and these and many other stories involving law enforcement information from authorities almost always gets more weight than from communities experience violence. A lot of media places, papers and whatnot, go directly to the police and pretty much write exactly what they talk about. Uh, their version and their version alone. They're the, the sole people. So they're, whatever the cops say just gets pre-printed and then gets backed up by whoever the media sources. Really good examples. This one fell into my lap because it happened today and it was so absurd that I'm glad I get to put it in here. Developing. Maryland State Police are investigating a trooper involved a fatal shooting in Leonardtown that ended in the death of a 16-year-old. Boy, that sure sounds like something happened to the 16-year-old, but I'm not exactly sure who did it. 
all of that is media choosing to bias police uh, views of things. They could have said Maryland State Police shot a 16 year old, but they don't. There's a reason that they do it that way. And it doesn't happen once. It happens all the time. There's a great uh, Twitter account called Editing the Gray Lady. They, they monitor the New York Times. And if they ever change a headline, they'll give you the, what it used to be and what they change it to. Um, or articles or subheadings, abstracts, that sort of thing. Officer near Minneapolis, they took out kills, shoots motorists who dies. So he just died somehow. And a crowd confronts the police it kind of makes it seem like things just happened, but the police were just there. They were like next to it. I don't know what happened. Minnesota officials say the police officer who fatally shot a black man at a traffic stop did so accidentally and meant to fire a taser instead. Oh, well, if they did it by accident, it's no problem. Uh, This happens all the time. And it is, it is siding with the police. That's a, that's a position that they take um, all, like I said, all the time. So let's talk about who, they bring a voice to the platform for. I don't know if you remember this guy, Sims Richard Spencer, he's a white supremacist and a guy who got punched. Um, This photo looks, makes him look pretty good, right? He's like in this nice, great coat uh, in DC, looks like a clean cut guy. This is the photo they chose to use um, when they talk about him. Last weekend, the articulate, highly educated 38 year old hosted a conference in the nation's capital and drew nearly 300 white nationalists and at least 50 reporters. Boy, he sounds pretty smart and great. And what I think is funny in this, Spencer, who splits his time between Arlington and Whitefish, has re- uh, reveled in the coverage from traditional media outlets NBC, CNN, NPR, Washington Post, New York Times. He's laughing because he knows what they're doing. He's, he's the one who like, loves this stuff, it makes him look great. Uh, and they did this. This was in 2016. This was after like, uh, like during the rise of the all right after Donald Trump. Like this is how they choose to talk about these people. These are choices that the media makes. I want to talk about the balance bias or the false balance, uh, both sides of them. Uh, this happens constantly. You can find this all the time. Uh, they present when this is when uh, journalists or media presents opposing viewpoints. And even though that they don't have any sort of like, like weight in one side or the, like one has way more weight than the other. They present them as equals because they're so obsessed with this false balance. Um, I will say it is impossible to be balanced. That's my view. It is impossible. It's denying your biases, denying the evidence and the truth that's out there. Uh, But the cartoon kind of says, Oh, here's, here's an astrophysicist. And here's some dude talking about flat earth. Are those equal? No, but if you put them on a show next to each other, it sure seems like they're equal. And I want to talk about this extending into compromise bias. I think, I, I don't actually know if that's a word, that's a word I'm using, um, where you get two political parties, especially uh, Democrats, Republicans, we need to just meet in the middle. We need compromise. That's what we need. So that's the best solution to anything. We just need to just find that middle ground. It will be great. Um, here's an example. Uh, somebody says we should kill a million people. Um, myself, personally, I don't think we should kill people. All right, let's compromise. Let's kill 500,000 people. That's right in the middle. We get both sides. They're getting something that they want. Uh, You did a bad one here. That's not good. Uh, Sometimes good things are good and bad things are bad. And trying to just merely find compromise all the time leads to results that aren't great. A selection of topics. Uh, Media selects political debates questions uh, with presidents and stuff. So they, what they talk about, they select it. They select what things get printed, what opinions get printed, who appears on shows, what appears on those shows, who anchors or hosts. This, this was so galling. I had to say this. I'm glad I actually get to use it. This was after a presidential debate. It's Chris Matthews. You can think he's a blowhard. He doesn't work there anymore. But this was what was presented to people when they were trying to decide who was going to be president socialist and i'll be glad to tell them share them with you in private and they go back to uh, the early 1950s i have an attitude about them i remember the cold war i have an attitude towards castro i believe if castro and the, and the and the reds had won the cold war there were been executions in central park and i might have been one of the ones getting executed and certain other people would be there cheering okay so i have a problem with people who took the other side i don't know who bernie bernie supports over these years i don't know what he means by social one week it's denmark we're going to be 
mean like Denmark. Okay, that's harmless. That's, a, that's basically a capitalist country with a lot of good social welfare programs. Denmark is harmless. It's pretty clearly in the Denmark is category, he? yeah. Are you sure? How do you know? Did he tell you that? A ridiculous moment, right? Talking about how Bernie was going to come kill him in Central Park. Unbelievable that nothing even come close to what he was talking about. But this is what people were hearing on MSNBC, the, the post-debate show. Um, even Chris, Chris Hayes is there saying, like, are you serious? Like, and even in the face of that, he's like, I don't know. Do you know? So but at least it, that puts people's ideas in their head, especially if they're, they're already against or for a candidate, like biases and stuff like that. Uh, so what do we do about this? That's kind of the whole issue here. Like, what do we do about this? Um, we do fact checkers, right? Everybody loves fact checkers. We've got a million of them now. Um, I don't think that those are particularly effective. Um, stuff is hitting so, people can lie so quick and so fast. And the people checking the facts, you still have to trust those people. And from what I've seen, not always reliable. Algorithms. Oh my God, we can use technology to get out of this. I haven't even thought about algorithms. The thing with algorithms is they're made by humans. They're not made in some robot factory for perfect, you know, consumption. Uh, there's a really good uh, article down there uh, about how algorithms can be biased, especially like how we do machine learning and AI as, as they call it. Um, those are all trained. Those are trained models. So the amount of the, what we put into those models is exactly what we get out. Uh, there's, there's instances where people face recognition, right? It's really good on people who look like me, white dudes, but not really good on people of color, women. You know, they didn't train the models to be that way. But these are biases that people don't even think about when they're talking about this. We can get rid of Facebook. I don't think that's the worst idea. I, I don't think Facebook is, is providing too much to the world in terms of good. Um, the problem is something also just takes place. Unless we impose regulations or change the incentive structure on how a lot of these media companies are, there's going to be another Facebook. Facebook, too. This time it's personal. It's going to come right along. We can burn Fox News to the ground. Uh, same thing. Like, there's already you, OANN and, and a bunch of these other places. There's a Fox in the wings waiting. Like, there's, there's always going to be somebody there. New media. What about new media? I'm surely the only person to ever think of this. What if we just created another one? Uh, I think you still run into the same issues. You still run into the incentives. I think you have to set it up properly where you're not constantly going after advertisers. And it's really hard in the way our economy is set up to do this. I don't have a great answer here, but I do think that those same incentives will take hold if you don't do something to buttress yourself against that. Small tips to help. Uh, this is what I try to do all the time now. Check the bylines. Uh, a lot of people don't check the bylines. Always check who's writing the article, opinion, video, whatever. A lot of times you'll, you'll be surprised how these people get into these positions. You know, it's James Surchank from Oil A Number One Institute. And this guy, for some reason, is saying climate change is false. Do you think he might have an incentive to say that climate change is false? I think you should be, be, you should be skeptical of the media. I'm not saying do you know the media is false fake news i'm saying you should be skeptical and you should check this stuff always think who does this benefit what are the sources of this information what's the incentive structure here why are they presenting it this way and not another way and what is being left out when they're talking about this um and again i must reiterate again everyone everything has an agenda and a bias so it gives you a better picture of how things are if you know what these are, like what their agendas and their biases are. They might be harmless. They might be good. They might not matter at all in this instance. But it's to not have that information is leaving out a key piece to figuring that out. This is another one. Um, avoid the where there's smoke, there's fire trap. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I've heard this. A lot of people are saying this. Trump loved that one. Oh, lots of people are saying this. And it seems that way. Um, if you're going to try to be skeptical, look for evidence. Look for what people are saying, the sources. Uh, lots of sororities surrounding an investigation without any hard evidence. There's, this happens a lot. You know, you see one article that writes another article about another article, and it's all referencing the same thing, but it seems like a lot of people are talking about this. Here's a great example. Uh, it's from Mr. Show, if you remember that show. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Mr. Gibbon. My grandfather started selling good food to good people back in 1926. Lenny, 
Someday you'll take over for me. <laughs> and I tried hard to keep his dreams alive by selling quality produce at the lowest prices. You know, we may not be as big and fancy as some other stores, but what's so fancy about high prices? Gibbons, the old-timey good place with 15 convenient locations. Sure, Gibbons Markets may save you a dime on select items, but this week at Fairsley Foods, all our produce is 25% off, and you'll never find a rat. Good prices, no rats. That's the Fairsley difference. This week at Gibbons Markets, we're having our Harvest Time Red Tag Sale. All red tagged items are 40 cents off. Oh, and just to let you know, we've never had a rat here at Gibbons. I, I don't know what that was in reference to, but uh, if you're looking for savings, look to Gibbons. Gibbons, with 15 convenient locations. So yeah, that's like... You just have to say that this, it doesn't have to have any evidence, but people start talking about it. It's like, how do you defend yourself? As soon as you say, there's not rats, people are thinking, this guy's really weird about all the rat thing. So this is kind of the conclusion after doing this for so long of what I came to, and I'm, I was surprised that I was not the only one. Are there one or two publications that I, as an average person, a biologist, can read to bypass this filter of our, par of our press? Now, if you ask what media can I turn to to get the right answers, first of all, I wouldn't tell you that because I don't think there's an answer. The right answers are what you decide are the right answers. Maybe everything I'm telling is wrong, okay? Could perfectly well be, I'm the only God. But that's nothing for you to figure out. I mean, I could tell you what I think happens to be more or less right, but there isn't any reason why you should pay any attention to it. Yeah, so, so really my answer is there, there's no technocratic way out of this. There's no magic key. There's no one weird trick. Um, the thing that we need, the thing that we're lacking, the thing that we have to figure out is trust. Um, that doesn't change because uh, it's technology or it's 2021 or anything else. This is this, the cornerstone of how we build our society. The dollar, um, the way we use the internet, you know, that little lock in the corner, the little lock is because of a bunch of different companies that come together and grant that certificate. And a lot of people say those are trustworthy. Um, people have tried to out technology trust for a long time. Bitcoin is based on the premise that like, oh, we can't trust anybody. So we'll have this. There's all sorts of things that that doesn't actually solve. You're still trusting the people who wrote it. You're still trusting everything as you're in this call security. All this stuff is based on trust, implicit or explicit. And we're not going to get out of the media problems without actually developing it with each other and, and people you trust. It, it, there's just no other way. We have to build community. We have to get together. We have to talk to people, do stuff like this. That's how you build it. Um, as far as I'm aware, there, there's no, there's no good way. And uh, I, I feel like that is a completely unsatisfying answer to all of this. Um, but that's like really all I got for it. Um, I, I, I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had the solution that you just install this thing. And then all of the good news comes. But I don't, I, I don't have that. Um, here is definitely, I would check out that. I've referenced it a lot in here, but Manufacturing Consent, either the book or the documentary or both. Uh, in Search of a Flat Earth, that QAnon uh, clip that explained it, that goes broader into conspiracy. It's really, really good. It's about an hour long. I would suggest watching that as well. Uh, and I want to say thank you for, for listening to me. I think I actually made time. 50 slides and I made time. Pretty, pretty proud of that. Um, and now... I will open it up to any questions anybody has uh, if, or discussions or thing you want to bring up. So one of the things, um, one of my suggestions that people should do is just read lots of different sources. Don't just trust one source, like not just MSNBC, not just the New York Times, not just Mother Jones, just read a lot of different sources because everything is biased. That's what I was taught in high school that you should read, get your news from more than one source. I and think that that's, that's, that's good. It's, it, like it, 
getting stuff and it, it depends on your sources too. So if you're not, if you have a lot of the major media sources and that's your main thing, you might be getting the same message from a bunch of different places, check sources, uh, for what they're using. A lot of people write the same, like they'll write an article based on the same source or they'll write an article based on a source based on an article. Um, get play if you can get it from different outlets different countries that sort of thing gives you a better broader picture of what might be going on so yeah i know that was like a lot and i didn't even scratch the surface i had i pared this down this was bigger than this i think you should do commercials matt because you know they, they like to cram a lot of information into a commercial <laughs> i sure did, do <laughs> did that quite well thank you Yes, there wasn't even anything about projectile vomiting at the end. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'll work on that though. I'll add okay. that. Okay, cool. But so I know I know it's like how do we spot disinformation, but I I'm still struggling with how to gently encourage others in my world universe to, hey, did you know that might not be good without telling them they're stupid? Yeah. Yeah, I, that's tough. Uh, <laughs> that's where it becomes very unsatisfying. I don't, I don't have like uh -huh. a great, a great answer for that. Uh, especially if people already, they have proclivities towards a certain thing, or they've been exposed to it. It's incredibly hard, especially because we have, um, it's like a sunk cost fallacy sort of thing, where like you're so invested in, or so invested in this thing, that to be wrong denies a part of yourself. So. It, no matter what the information or the evidence or anything you present, there's a part of us that doesn't want to give that up because then we're wrong. And that feels bad. Um, that's why I say a lot of these are human problems and they're not necessarily like media problems, even though there are problems with media, but like how we react emotionally has a lot to do with how we react to information. Are you open to criticism? Are you open to changing your mind or does not, not feel good and you don't want to do that? You mentioned some really good sources. Um, one that I like is called The Death of Expertise. It came out a few years ago. But I think one of the key things that I was so glad that you got to was the trust factor. Um, I'd love to have you, uh, if you're interested, to do a guest lecture in, in my American politics class in the fall on this. Um, but uh, there's no pay attached to that. Uh, <laughs> I'm used to that. Um, but, but the tr like, we do an exercise where we talk about, you know, how, how do we build up to this, uh, to this lack of trust? And there are all these different contributing factors. Like you said, like whatever list you come up with is going to be non-exhaustive, but you look at things like the lack of a social safety net, inadequate education, our culture wars, polarization, warped media incentives. And you end up with these large groups of people who end up feeling forgotten and besieged and alienated and they don't trust each other so you have that huge problem which I think you really got at and then at the same time you have these armies of politicians and conspiracy peddlers that are enthusiastically fanning these very dangerous flames right mm -hmm. of suspicion and they are trying to serve their own ends they have financial incentives they have political incentives uh to spread misinformation and this is a grand challenge of like that I think will take multiple generations to to address there are these things like you said there are these things that we can do on the individual level but it is one of those things that I think requires all of the solutions at once you know new media is a part of it and I think a lot of times we think let's get enough uh, progressive people to buy up or create billion dollar enterprises. And even with that, if we get rid of Facebook and we invest in these things, it's not just creating the alternative to Fox News. It's a million other things that you have to do at once. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I think that one of the things I didn't get to get to in the uh, in there, what I really wanted to talk about more just because the breadth was so wide um, is yeah, QAnon especially, there's grifters. They might not even believe it, but they know people are susceptible to it. Um, I think a lot of times we view ourselves, at least, uh, you know, it's hard to get lost in the fact that we're like these future people and we would never make mistakes of this, the future, the, the past people. And so you had snake oil salesmen and all this stuff. And that seems so archaic and so old, but we fall for that stuff all the time. We, I, and that's what I want to stress is every single one of us here, including myself, are susceptible to this stuff. 
Um, and grifters take advantage of people who are in these conspiracies like crazy by our merch. Like that's a one thing all the time that you'll see is like people in Q merch and all that stuff. That all came from people who are trying to make money off the thing. I saw someone at a local coffee shop here um, that was wearing a Q shirt. It was the first one I saw in the wild. I couldn't believe that like, oh my God, in the wild, I was just like staring at it. I was like, wow. And that was like um, right before the election or right after it was right around the election. But yeah, like that, that's a major part of it. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to really talk about it, but I guess I got, I got to put it in here at the end, but thank you for the kind words. I would be totally interested in talking to your class. Yeah, Chris says the Lafayette Independent. Yeah, absolutely. Anywhere you can get it out there. It's, it's so hard to get eyeballs in front of uh, different media and to keep that going um, because a lot of times it's just a labor of love. A lot of times people aren't making money at it. And especially with how uh, overworked people are, especially with a lot of things, it's really hard to devote time to that. Matt, I also have, about, go ahead, sorry. What about uh, media outlets that are not um, trying to make money? Nonprofits and things. Yeah, yeah. Those are great. Uh, I think ProPublica has a really, really good one. They do really exhaustive investigative journalism and they put people in local things or like local press outfits and they pay for it. I think those are great alternatives. Um, not to get too far into it, but a lot of NGOs and non and nonprofit stuff have a different structure and problems with that, especially how it's, it's in the US. But I think that that is a way to go towards a more independent press is when you're not constantly looking for advertisers. Um, Unfortunately, those are few and far between. And a lot of times too, you know, those incentives are different then. So those are good things to look at. So if you're a governmental agency or a nonprofit or something, who are you listening to? Who's like, who do you feel you need to be uh, deferent, like pay deference to? Um, but I, I do, I totally think that that is, those are, those are good ways to go about it. Again, ProPublica, that's a good one. If I had to give one, I just like the way that they've structured themselves. Who's that? ProPublica. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, another thing I didn't really get to talk about is is media conglomeration. So we don't, you know, look at look at our local paper here, uh, JNC. It's so tiny and it keeps getting whittled down. We're we we have something. A lot of places have nothing, and so there's there's articles. I don't know if it's in this list, uh, but Facebook groups have now taken up that mantle unfortunately, because there's not any sort of like, it's people just sharing stuff. So our loss of local media is really uh, detrimental to, to something like a functioning democracy. Um, and that's something I don't have a great answer to either, but it's not good. These are some of the, I, I'll post this online as well for anybody, but I tried to make my sources as exhaustive as possible. There's a lot of good articles about what I talked about here. I tried to back everything up as well as, you know, the examples I showed you. So uh, you do not have to just take my word for it. If you were, uh, Matt, to say that there are some media that are in the middle, what would you, what would you answer to that? The middle to, I would say the middle well, to. No, I mean, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say in the middle, but trustworthy. Yeah, I think that I wouldn't say news organizations are trustworthy. That's kind of where I'd come from. I would say journalists can be trustworthy. That's why I'm always going towards looking at bylines. A lot of times people move around to different outlets or they're freelance. If you find someone who tends to do good reporting on a subject, I'd look for them. But as always, check their sources too. Who are they talking Two or and if they're unnamed, I would be skeptical of that too. A lot of times we go with a lot of unnamed sources, and that to me, um, I know sometimes it's to protect anonymity, but a lot of times it's because people are too scared to talk about it or too not too scared, too politically scared to say something. Um, and, and to me, that just that sets off red flags. Uh, not to go down on that red rabbit hole, but yeah, look, individual journalists. I, I don't want to say that the media in general is is bad. I, I there's a lot of really really good journalism and good journalists that do work. Um, it's just that they have to fight against these, these larger entities. Well, if nobody has any more questions, I think I'm at time, which is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to get everybody out there by seven. Um, I never want to overstay my time and I appreciate everyone being here for that.